This program is brought to you by the faithful support of the friends and partners of Rick Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program with Rick Renner. Let's join Rick for a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Welcome to the program. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm so glad you've joined me for the program today. And I'm believing that today you're going to get something brand new from the Word of God as we look at Revelation chapter 1 and conclude our series on the vision of Christ, which the Apostle John had when he was on the Isle of Patmos. I say on the Isle of Patmos, but when you read Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, it actually says he was in the Isle of Patmos, and he was literally in the island because John lived in a cave on the Isle of Patmos with his assistant whose name was Prochorus. Now, you can't read about Prochorus in the book of Revelation, but if you read early Christian writers, they all tell the story that when John was exiled to Patmos, he went there with an assistant whose name was Prochorus. And by the way, I covered all of this on previous programs. It's so informational and really causes the New Testament to come alive. So I want to encourage you to go to our website, look at the archives. And if you didn't see these previous programs on Revelation chapter 1, watch them. They are loaded with instruction and teaching, I really believe, that will make a difference in your life. But John is in the isle that is called Patmos. He's in his cave. And while he's there, he hears behind him a booming voice. He turns to see the voice and he sees Jesus. It's Jesus who appears to him. And that's where we're going to begin today in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. Now, we've already covered this, but very quickly, we need to cover verse 12 again. It says, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. We've already seen that when John says, I turned, this tells us there was a physical element to this visitation. John literally physically turned. The Greek word that is used here is epistrepho. It means to physically turn around. John was not looking for this visitation. We already saw in verse 10, it was again on my experience. It was something that took him off guard and by surprise. If he had been looking for it, it probably would have appeared in front of him. But this is something that developed behind him. He heard a, verse com a voice coming from behind him. And the voice was so recognizable that verse 12 says, he turned to see the voice. He knew that voice. He had heard that voice many times earlier in his life when he walked the earth with Jesus. He knew that voice. He remembered that voice. How could he ever forget the voice of Jesus? And when John heard that voice, he quickly turned to see the voice that was speaking with him. And we saw before that when the Bible says he turned to see the voice that spake with him, this word spake really means that was conversing with him. And here we find that Christ is always trying to converse with his people. Christ wants to pull us into a conversation. He wants to talk with us. And now we find in verse 12, Christ was communicating or was conversing with John. So look at verse 12 again. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me that was conversing with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. We've already covered that. We're not going to cover that again today. But we know that the seven golden candlesticks represented the seven churches in the seven cities in Asia. Seven churches. Seven churches. Churches which were defective. But in spite of their problems, this verse says, Jesus said they were golden. The church is precious to Christ. And if the church is precious to him, it needs to be precious to us too. And if you have an attitude with the church, then you need to fix your attitude. Christ loves the church, and no one knows more about the church than Christ. He sees it all, and yet he still says the church is golden. So now we see the church symbolized as seven golden candlesticks, the Greek word luknos. It's really seven golden lamps. Then if you would look at verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, the word midst, we've already seen, the Greek word mesos, which means to be right in the very gut or to be right in the very center of something. Very important in this verse. Christ is not on the outside of the church. He's not shunning the church because of the problems that he later identifies in chapter two and chapter three. In spite of their defects and their challenges, Christ is still proud to be associated with the church and he's located right in the gut right in the very center. He's right in the very heart of the church. And when John sees him, what does John notice about him first above everything else? 
There were so many things in chapter 1 that John could have noted first. But what did John note first? What grabbed John's attention? What was most significant to John above everything else? That's what we find in verse 13. One like unto the Son of Man, and now he begins to describe what he sees. Clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. This is really where we're starting our new teaching today. When the Bible says, clothed with a garment down to the foot, it tells us the foot was exposed or the foot was not covered. This was a garment that went from the top all the way down the body, down to the foot. But now Jesus is standing here barefooted. This is exactly the description of the attire of the high priest in Exodus chapter 28. And here John sees Jesus before anything else as the great high priest. Jesus is standing in the midst of the troubled church. And Jesus is there as a priest where he's making intercession for them. Jesus is praying for them. He's praying that they'll hear his voice. He's praying that they'll receive his correction. He's praying that they'll make it. And in fact, when you read what he says to all seven of the churches, to all seven of them, he challenges them to be overcomers. And now Christ is a great high priest standing in the very heart of his church, proud to be associated with them, and as their great high priest praying for them, making intercession for them, that they'll hear his word, repent, and that they will overcome. And likewise, Christ is still praying for the church. He's praying for you. Even with our defects, Christ is involved in our life. He doesn't shun us. He's standing right in the midst of the church. And the verse continues to say, and he was girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Very important for John to see this. What does this mean? It means that around his chest, he had a golden belt. What does this mean? Well, kings and emperors at that time wore golden belts. And usually if they were lowly kings, they wore belts around their waist. But the more powerful they were, the more majestic they were, and the richer they were, they elevated their belt higher and higher and higher. And there was a reason for this. First of all, everyone saw their wealth. Secondly, it caused their gown to move in a more sweeping motion. It was very majestic. So now when we see Christ with a golden belt around his chest, it tells us that his robe, his garment down to the foot, is moving in a very sweeping motion Christ here is portrayed very, very majestically. However, even wealthy kings at this time did not wear belts that were solid gold. And yet that's what Christ has in this verse. This Greek word that is used describes a belt, and not just a belt, a very broad belt, and one made of solid gold. Very few kings, if any, could afford this. Most kings wore strands of gold that were woven together with other kinds of fabric. You could just see slithers of gold. But now we see Christ is so powerful. Christ is so majestic. Christ has so much supply. He has so much wealth, vast wealth, that he doesn't just have strands of gold, but he has a gold, a broad, wide gold belt wrapped around his chest. And why was this important for John? Because John had been exiled by a wicked king named Domitian who was ruling in Rome. And it seemed that Domitian had power over all. But now when John sees Christ, he understands, first of all, Christ is the high priest praying for the church. And secondly, Jesus appears as the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the emperor of all emperors with a golden belt around his chest to demonstrate how powerful, how majestic, and how vastly wealthy he is. No one compares to Christ, and that is still who he is today. Christ is all majestic. He has everything that we need. He is all sufficient to meet every single need in our life. But then the Bible goes on to say in verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool. Well, when you see how artists paint this, trying to create renditions of this text, very often they paint Jesus with pictures of white hair. That's not what this means. When the Bible says white as wool, it is the same phrase used in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, to describe Christ shining with glory at the Mount of Transfiguration. 
It is exactly the same phrase used in Matthew tw chapter 28, verse 3, to describe the angels who were present the day of the resurrection. And the Bible says they were shining like lightning. It's exactly the same Greek phrase that is used here. So now when the Bible says his head and his hairs were white like wool, it's really describing the glory of God was beaming from Christ. So now we see he is the great high priest. Secondly, we see he is a great emperor. He is the emperor of all emperors. And next, John says, I could hardly look into his face because his head and his hair were shining with resplendent glory, glory like I've never seen before. This was a glorious sight to behold. And John said his eyes were as a flame of fire. And again, very many times artists portray this. They paint paintings of Jesus with fire in his eyes. But does that verse say this? No. It says his eyes were as a flame of fire. It doesn't say his eyes were a flame of fire. They were as a flame of fire. So you have to think for a moment about a flame of fire. The Greek word phlos, which describes a flame of fire, a flame that is flickering, swirling, twirling as it arches and bends. Have you ever looked at a fire? When you look at fire, fire almost has intelligence. When you look into a flame, it has a magnetic pull. It's almost mesmerizing. When you look in a fire, you can nearly get lost looking into the fire as suddenly you're captivated by the flames as they bend and twirl and swirl. There's an intelligence in that flame of fire. And by saying his eyes were as a flame of fire, John is telling us what he saw when he looked into the eyes of Jesus. When he looked into the eyes of Jesus, he saw intelligence, such intelligence. And there was a magnetism in the eyes of Jesus, an intelligence, a magnetism. John is totally fixated, completely captivated by the eyes of Jesus, mesmerized as he looks into the eyes of Jesus Christ. He says to us, his eyes were a flame of fire, such intelligence, such magnetism. I've never seen such eyes as the eyes of Jesus. And in fact, when you read this in the Greek, it says the eyes of him, the eyes of him. It was unique to the eyes of Jesus. He had never seen this in anyone else's eyes. Then he continues, and he says his feet were likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Well, we've already seen in verse 13 that his feet were uncovered. He had on no shoes because he wore a garment down to his foot, but his feet have no shoes. They're uncovered. But when you read verse 15, it says his feet, plural, both of them, were likened to fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. Well, the Greek word here is very strange, very, very strange. It's a compound of two words, the word kalkos, which is the word for brass or bronze. And bronze in Scripture represents judgment. Please, please hear me. This is so very important. It represents judgment. But the second part of the word is libanos. And the word libanos is the word for frankincense. And frankincense was the incense or the perfume which was used in the temple, particularly in the Holy of Holies by the high priest, and it represented prayer. If you were to enter into the Holy of Holies, which you could not do, but if you did, you would have found the smell, the aroma of frankincense because it was symbolic of prayer. The temple, the Holy of Holies was filled with the aroma of frankincense. And when you compound the two words together, it forms the Greek word kalkolimbanos, strange word. And the reason it's strange is because you cannot mix bronze and frankincense. These things do not mix together. They're not alloys. How do you mix perfume with bronze? But that's what you find in this text. Why in the world would this word calculate and bonus be used in this verse? And why would Jesus' feet be symbolized in this way? Why are his feet seen as bronze that are doused with frankincense? That's really what the Greek means. Bronze doused with frankincense. The King James translators didn't know how to translate it. So they translated feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. Well, the churches that Christ is addressing in these chapters, chapter 2 and chapter 3, five of them have serious problems. And five of these churches are commanded to repent. They're commanded to repent. 
Jesus said to the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, if you don't repent, you're going to lose your position. You'll lose your place. I will remove your lamp. In other words, if you don't get it right, you will lose the status that you have had. Christ is going to deal with them. So Christ, in a certain sense, is coming with judgment to deal with the things that are wrong inside the church. But Christ is not in a rush to judge. Bronze is very heavy. Bronze is very heavy. In my living room, in my house, I have a bronze bear, which is symbolic of Russia, because I live in Russia. It's bronze. It sits on our coffee table, and every once in a while, Denise will say, would you please move that bear so it doesn't block my view of the television? Well, it's always quite a chore to move the bear because it's made of bronze. It's very heavy. It takes effort to move that bear because the bear is made of bronze. Bronze is heavy. It's hard to move. And the fact that Christ's feet are made of bronze tells us, even though he is walking in the direction of these churches in order to judge what is wrong, Christ is moving very slowly in their direction. Christ is never in a rush to judge. If you think about your own life and the things that have been wrong, God has always given you time to repent. He's always warned you in advance that he's going to deal with you and then given you significant time to self-correct. And now we find though Christ is about to deal with the churches that are in error, Christ is not running to judge them. But Christ is very slowly moving one foot at a time, hopefully giving them enough time that they'll hear his message and self-correct before he arrives with judgment. And that's where the word limbanos comes into this, the word frankincense. It's the picture of judgment doused in prayer. Christ is praying for them. We've already seen in verse 13, he appears as a great high priest. Yes, he has to deal with what's wrong. Christ doesn't want to judge them, and therefore his feet are doused in prayer. Christ is praying for them that they'll hear his message and self-correct before he arrives. And we see a perfect example of this in chapter 2, and I want you to look at it very quickly. In chapter 2, Jesus addresses the church of Thyatira, and in Thyatira, there's a woman seducing the church, a false prophetess whose name is Jezebel. And listen to what the Bible says. Jesus says in verse 21, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. When Jesus says, I gave her space, I gave her time. He warned her, but he did not quickly judge her. He gave her space. And now that's what we find in Revelation chapter 1. Even though Christ is coming to deal with what is wrong in the church, Christ moves very slowly, very steadily in our direction, sending the message, telling us what we need to change, and praying, doused in frankincense, the Greek word limbanos, hoping, believing that we'll self-correct so he doesn't have to appear and apply judgment. And in fact, it continues to say, his feet were like fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. This describes the bronze that is not set yet. It's in the process of being set, but it's not hard yet. And now we find Christ, though he has to bring correction, that correction is not hard. It's not hard fast. It's still in the crucible. And these churches have time to repent to avoid judgment. Isn't this a merciful way for God to deal with us? Then John says, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. This must have been easy for John to write this because John was living on the Isle of Patmos in a cave. And in the cave where John was living, he could hear the sounds of the sea. And if there was a storm, the storm and its sound was nearly overwhelming. The storm could be so loud, the waves beating against the beach, beating against the rocks, that you could even hardly hear another person trying to speak because of the overpowering sound of the waves. And now John says, when Christ spoke, his voice was like that. When Christ speaks, no one else can be heard. His voice is overpowering. His voice is heard above everyone else's voice. And then John says in verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his son, his countenance, was as the sun shineth in his strength. First of all, he says in verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. Right hand always represents a position of authority or power. 
So that's very important in this verse. So the right hand here, power, authority, and what does he have in his right hand? Seven stars. When the Bible says he had in his right hand, the word had, the Greek word echo, it means a firm grip. Whatever these seven stars are, they are in the control of Christ. They're in his right hand. And whatever they are, these seven stars have power and authority symbolized by being in the right hand of Christ. What are the seven stars? We know what they are exactly. Because in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible gives us the interpretation. And it says the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. The word angel, the Greek word angelos, a better translation would be the seven messengers, or it is the seven pastors of the seven churches. And now we find Christ has in his hand the leadership or the pastors of the seven churches. They are in the grip of Christ. These pastors do not belong to the deacon board. They do not belong to the advisory board. In fact, they don't even belong to the church. Remember, fivefold ministry are gifts of Christ to the church. And now we find them in the right hand of Christ, the ruling authority of Christ, the power of Christ. But that also means they are answerable to Christ. They are answerable to Christ. But there's something else important symbolically in this statement, and he had in his right hand seven stars. Remember, John had been exiled by Domitian. Domitian declared that he was God. That's what he said. He said that he was God. When Domitian's son died, he minted a coin, and on one side of the coin was the image of Domitian. On the flip side of the coin was the image of Domitian's dead child. And the dead child was sitting on a globe of the earth, and the dead child was playing with seven stars. And the dead child there was portrayed as Zeus or Jupiter. And here we have the picture that Domitian says, my dead child is now deified. He is as great as the gods. He is so great. He's playing with the seven stars of the universe. And by minting this coin and his child being Jupiter, his child being Zeus, he was saying, hey, if my child is God, who do you think I am? I'm greater than God himself. I am God. I'm the greatest of all gods. And he portrayed this as he and his son playing with the seven stars, having authority even over the universe. And now Jesus shows up. And Jesus opens his right hand and says, Hey, John, look what I have in my hand. Look what I have in my hand. I'm the one with the seven stars. If you want to know who is the Lord of the universe, look no further. If you want to know who really is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the real God of the universe is not this demented ruler sitting on the throne in Rome who exiled you to this island. But look, John, I'm the one with the seven stars. It is a declaration by Jesus about his own deity. And then the Bible says, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. The word used here is the Greek word romphea. The word romphea was a very deadly sword. And in this verse, Christ is portrayed as coming with a sword, a sword to excise disease that was trying to invade the, spirit, the churches. We know in Revelation chapter 2 that the church of Ephesus was dealing with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We know from Revelation chapter 2, the church of Pergamum was also dealing with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. These were deadly diseases, deadly teachings. Jesus didn't hate the Nicolaitans, but he hated their teaching and he hated their works. We know that when we look at the church of Thyatira, it also had been seduced by false doctrine. And now Christ loves the church so much that he doesn't ignore the problems, but he comes to lovingly correct to carry out a surgical procedure to excise those diseases from the church. And likewise, Christ still loves the church. And from time to time, Christ does what he has to do as he removes from the church elements that need to be removed. And that's what we now find in Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. And it says, And his countenance was as the sun shineth in all of his strength. Here we have the picture of glory so brilliant that you nearly cannot look into it. This is the picture of you looking into the sun in the most intense moment of the day. The same Greek word here is used to describe what happens in the winter when the sun is out in all of its glory and it shines on the snow and it reflects on the snow and the snow becomes a blinding light. You can't look into it because it is so glorious. And now John says, that's what he looked like. This was so glorious 
I could hardly look into it. So now we find in verse 13, Jesus appears as a great high priest. He appears as the emperor of all emperors. In verse 14, we find that he is shining gloriously and his eyes are filled with intelligence. They have a magnetic appeal. We find that he is coming with judgment in verse 15, but he's praying that he doesn't have to apply it. He wants the churches to repent and to self-correct. We find that his voice is the sound of many waters. In verse 16, we find he is the one who really controls the universe and that his countenance was as the sun shining in all of its strength. And when John saw all of this, verse 17 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I'm the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And then John begins to continue to write what he sees in the whole book of Revelation. And today we conclude our teaching on Revelation chapter 1, John's vision of the exalted Christ. And I pray that you've gotten something new from the Word of God. If you have a prayer need, Please use the information that's on the screen right now to contact me, to contact us. We are people of prayer. We pray sincerely for those who write to us or contact us. And if you have a prayer need, it would be our privilege to join with you in prayer to see God meet that need. But remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let the word of God release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. In A Light and Darkness, author Rick Renner illuminates the world of the first century church via a fascinating survey of the culture, people, and practices surrounding early believers in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, and on the island of Patmos. Renner's richly detailed historical narrative, enhanced by classic artwork and superb photographs shot on location at archaeological sites, will make the lands and the message of the Bible come alive to you as never before. Parallels between Roman society of the first century and our modern world underscores the urgency of Christ's warning and instruction in these seven messages to His Church today. Rick Renner's message, The Apostle John's Revelation of Jesus. Prepare to sit amazed as you gain new insights from the Word of God. Rick shares the riveting account of the exalted Christ appearing in a vision to the Apostle John on the island of Patmos to deliver his ageless messages to the seven churches of Revelation. This message is our special gift to you this month. Just visit our website at renner.org to download this free audio message along with a PDF of corresponding study notes to help you dig deeper into the Word of God. Thank you for watching this broadcast. Rick looks forward to being with you again next week. For more information on product resources or to learn how you can partner with this ministry, please connect with us at renner.org or call 1-800-742-5593. Also, please be sure to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.